good evening everybody warm welcome to the evening and uh, also welcome to jonathan who's here in the vmware role for the first time in uh, bangalore so uh, to introduce jonathan who will be the first speaker for the evening jonathan chadwick is our chief financial officer and executive vice president for vmware globally um, he joined vmware as the cfo and executive vice president in november 2012 So please put your hands together to welcome Jonathan Chadwick on stage. So thank you very much, and I appreciate uh, everybody's uh, attention tonight. And I know it is uh, late in the day potentially, and I know it is a busy time of the year. So I thought, as a CFO, I would share with you my perspective on what I see as being a pretty important global trend that's going on. And it's partly the role of the CFO and how it's changing, but it's also our role as we. Um, understand the shifts with respect to technology uh, in the in the in the workforce and globally as well. You know, this is the traditional view of the CFO. You know, and some of you may know this person. Some of you may aspire to be this person. I once aspired to this, be this person, certainly to have the, the slick haircut and the uh, the reports coming out on a regular basis, just like that. But the reality is, if if this is how your business is running today, it's not really. Uh, moving at the pace of business and the requirements that uh, business has, and the reality is, you know, the CFO today has a lot of pressures on him or her. It isn't just about compliance; it's about compliance all the way through to strategy. So, being an engaged uh, member of a team, collaborating but driving decisions inside today's business is vitally, vitally important. And as I think about how I run. My finance organization. It isn't just about waiting for the end of the month to come around and counting the numbers. It's about engaging in strategy, and it's about driving the business and driving innovation. And I think of the uh, the, the CFO role as having basically five key tenants. It's all starting with risk and risk management. And risk, you know, I don't just mean here about you know the risk of not having reconciliations, balance, etc. But how do we make sure the strategies of the company? Are really set up for maximum success, and yes, it's about making sure the financials and the results and the guidance we set externally really matches with, you know, the strategy and the direction. But it's also about understanding the direction that technology is taking as well, as also investments we're making uh, in M&A and our strategic opportunities and uses of cash. And fundamentally, I think the world. Is going from a place where we've been talking about mainframes maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, thousands of users, you know, arguably hundreds of applications, and time slicing of access to, you know, provisioning of computing power, to one where you know many of us are still in the client-server world, but that that was also revolutionary as well. Millions of users, thousands of applications, and the IT priority in that situation is to build, you know, pi.、Uh, Silos of computing power and to enable those as quickly as possible, but the buzzwords that are kicking around right now are around mobile and around cloud and around security. Billions of users tapping into millions and millions of applications, and those applications being developed in a far more agile manner than perhaps they've ever had before. And I don't know about you, but that's either a threat or it's an opportunity, depending on how it's coming up. If you're the CIO. And your CEO has come to you with his favorite Christmas present, and he said, "I want to actually have access to my email on this device. I'd like you to make it happen." The question is, how do you make that happen securely, and how do you make it happen in a scalable way? Because the next thing that happens is every single one of his or her direct reports immediately wants the same thing, and that's how BYOD got started. We want IT to go even faster in terms of enabling better business intelligence reporting, better scalability, and better ability to develop applications. Making developer environments available in a far faster basis. So, what VMware has been focused on overall is、um, three sort of core elements of our strategy. One being the software-defined data center, taking elements like compute virtualization, virtualizing servers, and freeing up dollars that would otherwise be sent, spent on the proliferation of servers inside data centers, and doing that in a virtualized way. And we're doing the same thing, and taking that same technology and taking it to networking and storage and management, and doing it in a way that's highly scalable and highly beneficial. We're doing the same thing with end-user computing, VDI or virtual desktop trends. Now enhanced by our acquisition of a company called AirWatch, which enables 
the mobile cloud world to become a reality. And last but not least, taking what we do on-premise to an off-premise world and matching that with what we call the hybrid cloud. And if you think about what I'm describing here, it's the ability to liberate resources and all those investments we're making in legacy infrastructure and allowing us to shift those dollars or rupees from the client server world and enable it to get ahead of where the world's going, which is the mobile cloud world. So we got to 97% real customer satisfaction that we were seeing, and we saw the technical staff requirements go down for maintaining these hands-on labs go down by over 80%. So net effect was small technical team within IT taking a very business-oriented lens on this and becoming and developing a killer application for solving a real problem that we had, tearing it up or building it up and then tearing it down as soon as it was finished. So hopefully you get a sense of those sort of capabilities being things that enable IT, which by the way doesn't report to me, but I partner with very closely, enabling IT to move far faster than it would otherwise be enabled to do. And this is where the world is going. We might all be at different stages of the, the progression around this, but being ahead of this trend, um, I found us to be you know, very, very critical as we think about how do we embrace that cloud and mobile world, but doing it in a highly secure, highly secure way. And I think Gartner says it really well in terms of the CIO and CFO game changer value, game changer conversation. We have to move from, as CFOs, from thinking about IT as just being a cost center to being a value center, which sounds like buzzwords, but the reality is IT has to enable the business to move faster and achieve different things. Those are all my prepared remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, with that, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening, and uh, we will now start off with our discussion. The topic of discussion this evening is achieving business impact through IT transformation. Let me uh, start off by introducing our first panelist for this evening, Mr. Madhu Menon, who's the CFO at Tesco, Mr. S. Subramaniam, who's the CFO at Titan Company Limited, Mr. T. Shridivasan, who's the Managing Director at uh, VMware India and Sark. And finally, Jonathan uh, Chadwick. This evening, we're going to focus on the role of the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer. Our economy has hit a rough patch, and uh, clearly the focus is on addressing that. So how do you really align with uh, the needs of your company, addressing issues of growth, looking at the broader strategy, while also delivering value, not just internally within the company, but also to your shareholders in times like this. Right, let me start off with uh, S. Subramaniam. In the current context of what you are facing um, uh, at the helm of Titan, in what are very challenging circumstances, how would you define your role, and where does IT fit in, in terms of your priorities? I believe IT as a service is where I think we should be we should be uh, transitioning towards. Uh, we are somewhere in between the business production and IT as a service uh, in, in Titan. Uh, we, we know we need to do a lot, but I think more importantly, what we, we are seeing from IT is what it can give the business. Hmm. Um, of course, there is the basic ERP for your processes, for your systems, for your, I mean, uh, your backend. That's, that's the given. Uh, that those are things that are standard today. But more importantly, the the new venue, avenues that we are looking at is clearly on uh, analytics. Hmm. Um, we are moving into the cloud and various things. We are working towards getting to a certain level in the next three to four years. Hmm. And as a CFO, if I don't have a long-term view, I think I'm failing in my job. So uh, the investments that I, I call them investments, I don't call them costs. Um, the investments that are required in technology are, are absolutely essential because they are going to give you kickers which are far more Hmm. Um, uh, than the cost that you've incurred um, in the past. So we, we have the statement that clearly there's this acceptance that investments, IT is seen as an investment and not as a cost center. Let me take this forward uh, to you, Madhu, because how much of that IT need do you, do you say uh, do the job for yourself within the company 
to uh, meet some of those IT investment requirements within the company and how much do you actually outsource? Because while at the same time you have companies coming to you, IT companies coming to you and saying, listen, this can save you this much of cost, this can, you know, we, we can take this much off uh, uh, as far as uh, your uh, costs are concerned, but maybe you could do an even more effective job yourself. Is, is that again a, a difficult question that you face? Uh, not really, because uh, you know we do both. Uh, while we, uh, you know, as a as a technology center in India, we support uh, our parent companies' uh, technology needs uh, worldwide. Uh, but we have a combination of both. So we do a lot of work ourselves. Uh, we also source some of these things. So it, it's not about uh, you know whether it is done in house or whether it's sourced. Uh, I, I think it's about the outcome there as well, and uh, probably. Uh, the best way of uh, you know achieving that outcome uh, so we evaluate uh, what is the best way and then take decisions accordingly because is there a certain lethargy should we say um, uh, shading about uh, companies who already have established systems say they have been using x software for for many years for addressing one of their basic needs as jonathan pointed out say the basic building block it infrastructure and you know says that is it really worth my while to for me to upgrade, go in for that additional cost? Will I really see those returns? Do you face that often, that kind of mindset, or is, or is it beginning to change? Uh, I think it's beginning to change, and that there is no getting away from that change. You will be forced to change. The market forces will demand that you upgrade the infrastructure uh, enough to mm -hmm. service your basic stakeholders. And, you know, there are two roles that all these gentlemen play, right? So you've got to ensure that you keep costs under control. And I think it's also important to look at how you're helping business grow. So IT is an enabler to growing the business. For example, in the case of consumer products like his, I mean, youngsters would like to want it to buy it on the phone. So right. you need to provide apps to ensure that they're able to do that. So you're not just keeping the lights on in terms of having the ERP system, but actually enabling companies to do much more by ensuring that those IT systems are, I, if, for lack of a better word, I would say today aware, which means they got to take into context of what people would require today. So, so Jonathan, you know, being more agile, it seems like just hearing some of the requirements that a CFO has to do, and especially in a world where technology is changing by the minute, you know, the question I ask myself is, you know, it's, it's bewildering, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, if I was a CFO, that it's bewildering so many technologies, what do I decide, where do I even start, if at all, for some of the, you know, the SME companies who are just starting that curve. Um, how do you keep pace? I think the reality is that, you know, we have to continually learn. I mean, things are changing very, very rapidly, and, you know, it's very important to stay abreast of the transitions and looking at what best practices are and understanding what companies like Gartner and IDC are really telling us. And when I talk to CIOs today, some of the biggest problems they've got are how do they keep within their control some of the workloads and applications that are actually going to the cloud in maybe unsanctioned ways? They need to be a lot faster and a lot more agile about how do they respond to business demand. And so things like network virtualization and management tools really help them start to think about that. So, right. But I look at you know, benchmarking and I look at some, some of the key trends that have already been proven. As you can tell, there are companies in multiple different phases of, of development here. Not everybody needs to be on the bleeding edge to really benefit. What happens to the smaller companies? And here, uh, Madhu, let me come to you because you've had experience with startups as well. And, but um, what, what would you advise, for instance, uh, a CFO of a for much smaller company and perhaps just at the starting phase of his career? You know, what technology has done is to essentially break barriers. You know, for example, if, uh, you know, as a startup company uh, or as an entrepreneur, if you need to do a, uh, if you need to have a web page of yourselves, uh, probably, you know, a few years back, you need to have a web server, you need to have a database server, you need to have an application server, you know, a bunch of things. Uh, today, it's uh, you know you got to pay probably 250 rupees and you're up and running, right? Mm. So uh, the, the 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 beauty is that uh, you know anybody can aspire to actually uh, go out and challenge. So what you're seeing is technology creating that uh, the, the bunch of insurgents that could go out and challenge people. Uh, so it's it's not necessarily a issue. It's right. actually a big opportunity that technology provides uh, entrepreneurs, people who start. <laughs>
have seen Indian companies, of course, uh, grabbing it with both hands, especially on the e-commerce side. But uh, what about um, companies which have had entrenched systems? And Subhal, I'll come to you here. Uh, and by entrenched systems, I'm talking about, say, there is an X way of doing things. And I I'm looking for a specific solution. Let's talk about your vertical retail, for instance. And, and you want to look for a solution. You, you want to perhaps outsource it or give it to somebody who can give you those uh, cost savings. How do you start the process? And are you actually able to get that solution? Or in the Indian market, you find you actually have to innovate in-house? Let me just give you an example between our own. Uh, we started with watches, right? And we had a certain uh, POS um, point of sale system. We had a back end was SAP. We went with that. And then we went to the jewelry. When we moved to jewelry, we had a problem with SAP. We did not have what we needed in jewelry. Because in jewelry, you have different units of measurement, units of measure. So uh, you have grammage, you have units, pieces, and so on and so forth. You need to track everything. Now, at that point in time, you had to move to some other platform which could offer you that. And therefore, we went to Oracle. Hmm. Right? Therefore, we have a unique system where we have two ERPs running simultaneously with us. The back end may be integrated. but the ERP is separate. So the point is you need to look at what you can adapt, otherwise it doesn't work. Well, there will be some customization anyway uh, that you need to do, but th th I think the trick is to minimize that as much as you can. But Madhu, how often is it, and I'm not just talking about in your current context, where the strategy of, uh, and I'm talking perhaps in, in the context of Indian companies especially, um, you know, traditionally speaking, where the strategy of the company, the broader vision, is actually shared perhaps with the CIO or even with the IT team or, you know, where it's percolated downwards from the senior management. Because sometimes, and most of the time still, unfortunately, there is a wall, isn't there? Uh there is. Uh, I, I think uh, in the case of established companies, probably there's a bit of a uh, you know barrier internally in terms of adopting changes. But you could also look at uh, you know the emerging companies. You know they really don't have to struggle with some of the legacy. So uh, probably you could look at that side. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen great examples in India where people have gone out and uh, and done stuff. You know I've looked at this um, question of where CIOs report. Mm. You know in the states, and I don't know if it's true globally, but. In the States in particular, about 50% of CIOs report to CFOs, and 50% report either directly to the CEO nowadays or to the COO, mm. or some other, you know, I think 1% reports to some other random person inside the organization. Mm. But, you know, if we as CFOs that are managing CIO organizations think of them as being just cost centers, then we're part of the problem. So this cascading of the corporate strategy down is really important. We have to make sure the CIO is a progressive leader who's actually constantly trying to get hold of the information around the corporate strategy and dragging it down. But if we're not passing that information down and helping to educate them, we're putting them into the cost silo, not into the value creation silo. So right. that, that, that's a very important balance. And again, this trend of having the CIO report all the way up to the CEO is where some of the you know, leading edge practices are taking us, I think. Right. Um, Trini, if I, if I can come to you, and again, the various stages of technology adoption, and uh, you know, there's infrastructure, there's applications, and then there's the business focus, very specific to what your company needs. Uh, if you look at the uh, Asian and uh, you know, the, uh, the region that you're looking at, which stage would you say, roughly, companies are in, or would you categorize it more by business vertical? No, I think it would be across verticals, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there are several leading edge adopters. Mm -hmm. My good friend here, good example of early adoption of the correct technology. More importantly, I think if you look at uh, people on the journey, they very quickly realize that uh, once you start on the journey, you're always under pressure to deliver more, right? You, whether the CFO or the CIO working through the CFO, uh, Business says if you can deliver that previous project at a lower cost at in a faster time, hmm. why are you not doing this better? Hmm. So there's a constant pressure to get better at what you... So when we talk of business transformation using the uh, IT transformations, today CFOs are able to have a conversation with CIOs to say that <coughs> what, what ways can we invest this? Should we do it in-house? Can we get it done from... Uh, outside, so the infrastructure is taken care of. So now, the CIO needs to deliver on the information hmm. to either the CFO or to the CEO wherever he reports. So that transformation, 
I think will happen in all companies, big or small, doesn't matter. But the ability to have a business discussion is mandated today. But Subhuj, I mean, how uh, difficult has it been for you, for instance, personally, to make these kind of transitions? Do you still feel you're firefighting every day? Or uh, are you actually able to think back and say, okay, let me look at the big picture. The other stuff is all taken care of. Um, the earnings will happen. We'll meet the targets. I just need to look at the next maybe two <laughs> years. What's going to be my <laughs> overall direction? Uh, you do have to look uh, long term. Uh, without which you can't look at what the next steps are going to be, right? You have to do that, but you can't not to look at the short term as well. Mm. Therefore, if you look IT, for example, yes, we did a, a five-year plan, for example. What, what would the next five years be? So th the long-term strategy is there in place, right? Mm. Now, then we have milestones, and then the question is just to see whether those milestones are being met. Of course, that means investments, and investments can change if, if, if the economic environment is different as it is today, for example. So then there could be some postponement uh, that you might have to do, they're forced to do. But that's fine. I think you have to look at uh, um, these things dynamically. Jonathan, you, you get a good night's sleep? I mean, you, you seem to have your strategy down in place. VMware itself has been, has undergone several changes. <laughs> it's an incredibly exciting role because we're talking, every, you know, from one minute about how do we make sure compliance is managed very, very um, well in a scalable and seamless way, all the way up to how do we make sure that IT investments and other investments are really aligned to strategy and then we're also helping to craft that strategy. So um, I usually get a good night's sleep, not because I'm not thinking about stuff, but usually because I'm so tired by the end of the day that it's uh, not, <laughs> usually, not usually an issue. So uh, would you agree, Madhu, too many things on your plate, you think? Or is it, it it's just necessary, the circumstances have you know, uh, forced you into learning quickly and uh, um, taking all this on your plate. You know, and I agree with uh, what Jonathan said, because the expectations are that uh, CFO is not just a uh, bean counter and, you know, churn out, churn out those reports as we saw in Jonathan's presentation, but, you know, is actually a, a progressive, to quote Jonathan, a progressive business leader, understands uh, multiple functions, uh, is hands-on. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the expectation. So, you know, it's, it's really not, uh, in that sense, uh, stressing and stuff like that. I think it's, it's an it's, it's a adventure. Uh, and at least I have fun. You have fun, and of course, uh, the, the next step is you've got to go and convince the CEO of all the decisions that you have made, and of course, uh, uh, the, the performance which has come in, right? That's right. Okay. So I'd like to have final wrapping up comments because the, the canvas which we started with was a fairly broad one. Uh, however, we focused on the role of the CFO, and, and I, I would like to end with final comments coming in from each one of my panelists in terms of really how they see this landscape changing over the next, um, both in the short term and perhaps uh, the long term. Uh, uh, may I start with you, Shini? The role of the CFO is changing for the better, I would say. I think the, today he's able to manage the transformation that is required very quick. He has the tools to manage the transformation, mm. the ability to have that business discussion and to figure out what is the best way to get things done. That will, you know, the success of that organization will depend on those decisions. Subhu? Well, I think uh, basically the CFO role has changed significantly over the last so many years now, maybe the last 10 years maybe. Uh, we are more business guys than, than we are, we are bean counters, yeah. far more business, business guys. And I think if we are not there, we can't be a CFO, simply. Uh, you have to look at the value rather than simply looking at cost. Madhu? Um, a few years back, uh, we used to talk about IT in business. And I think today, it is IT-led business. Uh, you know, especially when you talk about digital economy. Uh, businesses will have to adapt. And I think CFOs will have to enable that adoption. Jonathan? Yeah, it's, um, when I think about you know, the role of the CFO, you know, it's the same as, in some ways, the opportunity that the CIO has. We're one of the few umbrella organizations across an entire business. You get to see all aspects of the business. Everything ultimately rolls up to numbers, or everything else rolls up sometimes to be an IT problem or an opportunity. And when we think about those two roles together, you have to be thinking about, okay, how do we enable the business to go faster? Because even though the business might not be asking for something today, they just don't know quite what question to be asking. And so, frankly, you know, being an enabling CFO rather than just that cost-counting CFO is going to make you and your businesses way more successful um, going forward. So 
Um, I think it's a broad transformative role and as uh, was just, um, uh, just stated, I think the pace of change and expectations on the role are getting even faster. Right, thank you. On that note, gentlemen, many thanks for joining us uh, for this discussion. And that brings us to the end of this special edition uh, on ET Now, Achieving Business Impact Through IT Transformation. Thanks for joining in.